Praise be the weapon that silences the enemy. Let praise be the weapon that conquers all anxiety. Let it rise. Let praise arise. We sing your name in the dark and it changes everything. We sing with all we are and we claim your victory. Let it rise. Let praise arise. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. For fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lifts him high. With all creation cry, God, we praise you. Oh, we praise you. Oh, let faith be the song that overcomes the raging sea. Let faith be the song that calms the storm inside of me. Let it rise. Let faith arise. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. For fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him high. With all creation cry, God, we come on, say. I'm 
sing it again. Way maker, miracle worker. Way maker, miracle worker. Way maker, miracle worker. Sing it again. Way maker, miracle worker. Way maker, miracle worker. Way maker, miracle worker. Way maker, miracle worker. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it.
for choosing us as your children. Lord, we love you and we praise you today. Lord, we thank you. Can you just lift up your hands and just say thank you, God? Lord, we love you. We love you. We love your kingdom, oh God. Let your kingdom be established on earth as it is in heaven, oh God that we, your children, would rise up, Father God. I thank you right now. 1 Corinthians 1.10 says, and I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you may be united in the same mind. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind. God, I thank you that your kingdom will be seen on this earth through the church. I thank you that we will be united, Father God. I thank you, Father God. No division. We won't look like the world, but we'll walk in unity today. God, I thank you that there is unity in the body. That we will rise above the situations and the circumstances and be about the Father's business today. 
God, I thank you that we are rising up even in this moment. We thank you, Father God. I just hear God keep saying that unity is more important than being right. Come on, come on. Unity is more important than being right. Be about my business, says the Lord. I am raising up the church. The church will advance in this hour. The church is advancing in this hour, says God. God says to rise up. Sometimes you just got to elevate your thinking and start thinking the way Christ thinks. Get in your word. Get off the TV. Get in your word. God says to be unified. Be unified. Be unified. Watch your communication. Watch what you're talking about. Watch what you're thinking about. Do not let division come into your home. That spirit's running rampant in the earth, but it ain't got to touch us. We're the kingdom of God. We walk in love. We walk in unity. We walk in peace. We're overcomers by the power and the blood of Jesus. God, I thank you right now. God says, I'm still on the throne. Can't nobody move me. I'm still on the throne. God, we thank you this morning. We thank you this morning. It's you we serve and we love God. We thank you, oh God. We give you glory and honor this morning, oh God. We thank you, God. I hear an army rising up. I hear an army rising up and we thank you, God, for unity. We thank you for peace. God, we give you glory and honor. In the precious name of Jesus, God, we thank you for this beautiful day that you've made, oh God. That you've made. You've made this day, oh God. And you shall not be moved. Because we stand with you, we shall not be moved. God, we give you glory and honor. In Jesus' precious name. you to Live Free Church. Those of you who are in the building, we welcome you. Those of you who are watching us in your pajamas, we welcome you too. We are so glad that you are here joining us today. This is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. It is so good to see these beautiful faces. It just, it, it blesses my heart so much. I want to just share just really quickly what I shared Monday night. Every second Monday of the month, the women, we're going to have prayer via Zoom at 7. And this last Monday night, I shared um, a little bit about Jonah 2.8. Jonah 2.8, it's one of those verses to me that is like hidden, it's like hidden in the Bible. And when I found it, which I was actually an adult before I found this verse, and I, it just it spoke to me so deeply, and it says this, those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. And so we talked a little bit about what are the idols in our lives. Idols can be what people think about us. Idols can be pride. It can be our possessions. It can be our emotions that we elevate them above the word of God. And so realizing that whatever idol that we're clinging to, it's like, Lord, I don't want to cling to any idols because I'm giving away my grace. I'm forfeiting the grace you have for me. And it's just amazing. And a sister called me last night and we were talking about this. I didn't get permission to share. So I'm not going to share her story, but just how God used that verse to speak to her and how it, it also moved her to action. And so when we hear the word of God, we need to hear it and then take action and be doers of the word. Amen. So I wanted to share that. So don't miss it. Second Monday nights at seven. Okay. So right now we're going to worship the Lord with our giving. 
So um, some of you are giving online, some of you are giving that are in here. And I just wanted to read just really quickly a little bit about Elijah and the widow from 1 Kings 17, starting with verse 8. And it says this, Then the word of the Lord came to him, Go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. For I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. Keep in mind, the widow did not yet know. but You'll see what happens. But God knew what was happening. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, Oh, and bring me a piece of bread too. And she said, As surely as the Lord God lives, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil. I'm gathering a few sticks to go home, make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said. But first, make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me. And then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, your God, says. The jar of flour will not be used up, and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. And she went away and did as Elijah told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and for her family. You know, we read that and we're like, okay, that's this great story in the Bible. Sometimes I wish that we could read it and it's like the first time all over again. But you know, Elijah was telling her, okay, do this first. And I've talked to some people sometimes that have said, you know, I, at the end of the month, sometimes 10% is not left over. And so what I say and what I think when people say that is, well, give God his first. Give God his first. And I was so proud of Travis when he was teaching on the offering the last week or a couple weeks ago, how he said, you know what? Jesus had talked about, we're not supposed to test God, but yet God told us in Malachi that we could test him in this, that you can see, okay, God, if I give you my tithes and offerings, will you open the windows of heaven? Will you pour me out a blessing? And then my last thing is if you turn to James 2, it talks all about faith and deeds. So sometimes we're like, okay, yeah, I believe you, God. I believe you, but do we? Because if we believe him, then we're going to do what he says, right? And so it says in James 2, 14 through 17, it simply says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without food and clothes, and one of you says, Go in peace, keep warm, be well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs. What good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. And so I think about that, that widow. It wasn't just enough for her to say, okay, yeah, well, I, I believe God, but she had to do something. And so she had to go and make the, the bread for Elijah first. And so just asking God this morning, God, what would you have for me to do? Let me be obedient. Let me be a, a, a doer of your word and not a hearer only. Amen? Amen. So let's say our confession of faith. Amen. God is my source of all blessing in heaven and earth. God's will is that I am blessed beyond all measure and beyond my expectations. He is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all I am able to ask or think. Giving is an act of my faith, and I cheerfully give back to God what he has given me. As I trust God with my tithes and offerings, I trust that God will bless the work of my hands. In Jesus' name, amen. You morning, everybody. Good morning. <laughs> These are your announcements for Sunday, November 15th. Many of our announcements are also featured on our GroupMe app, so I just want to give you a reminder of that. If you deleted it, reinstall it, delete some of those pictures of your kids to get more room. <laughs> just kidding. I'm just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> 
Okay, if you don't have the Groovy app already installed and you still want to be able to understand all the wonderful activities that we have going on, please email us at info at livefreechurch.org. Again, info at livefreechurch.org so you can stay up to date on all the things that are happening. Um, I want to give a shout out to Teen Life. Woo! We had a little Thanksgiving, virtual Thanksgiving celebration, and we had games and crazy stuff, and it's just awesome to see their personalities come out and see how loopy these kids really are. <laughs> I guess they follow their leaders, huh? Um, <laughs> no, it was really awesome. We had a great time with the kids. Um, I, I can't tell you how long you know, how much I laughed, how long since I, since I laughed with them and at them. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I just want to give out the shout out, a shout out to Teen Life. It was really awesome. So thanks for participating. And make sure you keep track of your names, you know, your crazy names for the games so we can keep tallying up those points. All right. Um, Lippery Kids, woo! Awesome. Live Free Kids will be this evening at 5 p.m. with the awesome, amazing, wonderful, and talented Pastor Cheryl. Woo! <laughs> so Pastor Cheryl is going to start letting the kids earn prizes. So please encourage your kids to join so they can get awesome prizes. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Over to you, Lou. Praise the Lord. <laughs> so we, we also have uh, our men's prayer uh, Zoom call that will be taking place uh, tomorrow, Monday, uh, November 16th at 7 p.m. Uh, Pastor Tyrone will be leading that. So looking forward to that, men. Uh, again, that's Monday at 7 p.m. I want to encourage you to participate uh, in that as well. Uh, also, we have our uh, corporate prayer uh, Zoom every Tuesday and Thursday for uh, those who uh, are available at 7 a.m., that's Tuesday, November 17th, and Thursday, November 19th, that's a study in the book of Proverbs led by Pastor Terrell and a time of prayer together. Amen? Awesome. We also have love life. Couples, couples, couples. Where are you? Yes, yes. Let's come out and be a part. Join other married couples uh, for a Zoom fellowship Thursday, November 19th at 7 p.m. And that will be led by our very own Pastor Chad and Jelana Walsh. Again, love life. All couples come out. Yes, yes. <laughs> Folks are excited about that. Uh, couples come out. It's a great and encouraging time in the Lord. Uh, as we just share a little bit about our own relationships, it's great and encouraging in that time. Amen. And I'd like to add, don't worry. What happens at Love Life stays at Love Life. <laughs> So I want to say that Real Life Women's Ministry is this Saturday, November 21st at 10 a.m. with Pastor Tara. So I'm going to do a whoop whoop. <laughs> Shout out to Pastor Tara. <laughs> okay, so coming up on Sunday, November 29th. Sunday, November 29th. Mark your calendar. Write the date down. 10.30 a.m., that is our Friends and Family Sunday. Yes, yes, we are excited about that. Please invite someone uh, either to come to church or to join us online. You can be a, an online friend or you can be a friend in person. Uh, we're inviting you to take part in that. If you don't have any friends, this is a great way to make one. So go invite someone and then they can be your friend. So this is a great opportunity to be able to do that. I promise you, this is really not our comedy hour. <laughs> um, Living Impact Outreach Ministry. The outreach ministry team is looking for dedicated members to join their team. The Christmas outreach is fast appro approaching, and this is a great time to share God's love in a tangible way. Please contact us at outreach at livefreechurch.org. Again, outreach at livefreechurch.org. And I do encourage you to come out and participate. 
you know, a lot of people are going stir crazy and they want something to do. Um, we're gonna be doing it in a socially distanced, safe way. So I encourage you to come out, you know, make a difference. Don't just focus on the things that you're going through, but reach out and be a blessing to someone else. So step outside of your own thing. And when you're going through depression, you're going through struggles, um, one of the ways to climb out of that is by reaching out and seeing somebody else's needs. Amen. Uh, we've officially opened up our church building, so some of you online have seen. Uh, we have uh, people here in the house, and we're so glad that you're here with us uh, today. And we want to officially invite those of you who haven't made it out yet, if you are feeling comfortable uh, to be able to do that, we want to invite you that uh, the doors of our church are open for you to come uh, on Sundays and worship with us. If you'd like to do that, please visit our website. It, again, that's livefreechurch.org. I feel like we've said that about 30 times. <laughs> if you don't know our website, it's livefreechurch.org. But if you go there, there's a, a short little form for you to fill out uh, to let us know that you'll be coming so we can make appropriate accommodations for you, all right? Like, subscribe to our channel. Um, it's Live Free Church GA. That's who we are on YouTube. And on Facebook, we are Live Free Church. Awesome? All right. Well, today we are continuing uh, our four-week series, uh, a brand new series we started uh, just last week on uh, uh, healthy homes in an unhealthy world. And so last week I talked about how to have a healthy marriage. And I want to encourage you, you know, um, like Tara said, you've got to apply the word of God and the truth of his word so that you can see the results in your own life. It's one thing to hear it. James 1 and 22 says, be ye hearers and not doers only. So these words that I am uh, giving you, the, the word of God and the messages that come forth here, let me tell you, if you would apply the principles and the truth of God's word to your life, you will see the difference. Amen. And so today, I am going to talk about how to be a healthy man. Everybody say, how to be a healthy man. Say it again, how to be a healthy man. Now, next week, Tara's going to talk about how to be a healthy woman. She's always amazing. She's a, she's a gifted communicator. I remember when we were dating, we both flew out to my father's church, and he's a pastor, and, and uh, he ordained us back then at that time. And um, me and Tara preached a message together, and I was just all oh, this and that. I was going through, and then Tara would get up and be like, Jesus loves you, and the church would be like, yeah. And I'd be like, well, the Greek and the Hebrew breaks down like this, and and then Tara says, you know, God really cares for you. Yeah! And I'm like, Tara, we ain't preaching together no more. I, that, that hurt my, my ego a little bit. And so anyway, <laughs> but she is really a blessing. So I'm looking forward to it. We're looking forward to that next week. Now, now some people believe, um, these are a few things some people believe about men, okay? Some people believe men are like mascara. They usually run at the first sign of emotion. Yeah, there you go. Some people believe men are like copiers. You need them for reproduction, but that's about it. Ooh. Some people believe men are like mats. They only show up when there's food on the table. Others believe men are like used cars. They're easy to get, they're cheap, and they prove unreliable. And others believe men are like plungers. They spend most of their lives in the, hardware, in the hardware store or the bathroom. All right, let's give it up. That was my comedy routine for the morning. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> now I know I'm not talking to any plungers today, amen. <laughs> but what does the Bible say about being a man of God, a healthy man, a, a man who is whole in his life. Most men don't grow up seeing this kind of man. So I want to take some time today, and I want to talk about it. I want to dig into God's Word. And, and so I want to uh, look at what the man is supposed to be in the home. Now, before we, we get to the Scripture, I do want to give you a little bit of history, okay? Is that okay? On the evolutionary uh, uh, male in America, the evolution of the American male. Now, in the 1950s, 
Men from World War II uh, returned home in the 1950s. Divorce really was unheard of. Over 90% of young girls and boys, they had a mom and dad in the home. They built a house together and they lived together as a family. Now in the 1960s, uh, we, we heard about let's make love and not war, right? And existentialism comes into the reality of how people actually live. Existentialism is a philo philosophical theory that people are free to do whatever they want to do. That's what that big word means, right? So in the 60s, people had a mindset that we can do whatever we want to do without restrictions. Matter of fact, I remember when we started this church and, and my wife and I, were, and we named the church Live Free, I called my grandma and I said, hey, grandma, we're starting a church. She said, oh, baby, that is so good. I said, grandma, pray for us. She said, okay, I so will. I said, she said, what's the name of the church? I said, Live Free. She said, Live Free? No, I said, grandma, it's Live Free. She said, oh. Does that mean you can do whatever you want to do? I said, no, Grandma, no, Grandma. We're teaching people how to live a life of freedom through Christ, not living a life of whatever they want to do. But that's what happened in the 1960s. People actually went buck wild. So now, now, now there was a relative truth in, uh, in the 1960s, and, and all of a sudden sex and, and love and marriage are now separated. People in the 60s said you can have sex with someone, but you don't have to be committed to them. You don't have to be committed in a marriage relationship. There's no commitment to marry. And, and the effect of this, it, it started the decline of the family. It started the collapse of the family. Now it's 2020, and we're still seeing the results of what was planted in the 1960s. And then comes the 1970s, and by the way, I'm a 71 baby, amen. The 70s is where it's at. If you're 70, baby, holla, hey, man, amen, all right. But in the 1970s, feminism was birthed. It, it was not birthed so much, but it came to its height. And, and now, obviously, women's rights are very important. But the feminism of the 70s was a radical movement. The feminist agenda pushed uh, that men and women are essentially the same. It, it, they said there are no real differences between a man and a woman. And then here comes the 1980s. People got tired of, of all of the issues of the day and the sexual issues, and it became a it's all about me decade. <laughs> It was all about materialism, and the more stuff was, was better. And then we saw more people began to become workaholics, and, and the home began to suffer. And then comes the 1990s. And what I want to say about the 90s, it was a decade of confusion. We have the Columbine shooting, which was, with a, which was the first of its kind in our schools. The sex roles were blurred and, and changed. Men and women no longer knew their roles in society or at home. The rise of homosexuality took place and openly gay things became more prominent in our American culture. And by the 2000s, America is going in all kind of different directions. We've got all kind of this confusion going on. It's in the last two decades that we've seen 80% of kids growing up who will not have a father in the home at some point in their childhood from 0 to 18 years of age. Families are collapsing with the financial fallout and the emotional fallout of absentee fathers. About 65% of people live together before they get married. They kind of want to try it out. <laughs> Somebody said, why buy the cow when you can get the milk free, huh? But 65% believe in cohabitation. And research tells us that if you live together before marriage, it increases the likelihood of divorce once you are married. Now, I just want to tell you, don't get mad at the preacher, amen. 
I'm just giving you some facts. And so the evolution of the American male during these last 60 years has produced two major unfortunate consequences. The father absent family and the impacting of changing roles. A report by the U.S. government called this uh, uh, Code Blue. They did a study of adolescents in America. And now this report found that never before has one generation of American teenagers been less healthy, less cared for, and less prepared for life. That's what our teenagers are dealing with today. Another study showed that boys suffer most from the absence of a non-involvement uh, father, a father who's not in home or a father who's not involved. According to the National Center for Children in Poverty, boys without a father are twice as likely to drop out of school, twice as likely to go to jail, and four times more likely to need treatment for emotional and behavioral problems. Dr. William Pollack from Harvard University and the author of the book, Real Boys, he says this, divorce is difficult for all children, but divorce is devastating for males. Why? Because there's a lack of discipline and supervision in a father's absence. I have three boys, and you know, my wife and I, we, we parent together. We'll be talking about parenting in a few weeks. But listen, we, we parent together, and, and we balance each other out. My little 11-year-old comes knocking on the door. I'm like, what do you want? Get, go back to your room. Tara's like, oh, what, Trenton, come on in. What do you want? You know, my boys used to get in trouble. I, you know, I'm the first one disciplined. Go to your room. You know, I'm going to spank you, da-da-da-da. Tara, you know. She's like, oh, oh. <laughs> but my boys are respectful of authority. They're respectful of, of people. Why? Because they had a father in their home that was disciplining them when they needed to be disciplined. But a father who is unavailable to teach his son uh, what it means to be a healthy man, that is what's also occurring in our homes. And when there's no man in the house, this creates a cycle of fatherless generations and unhealthy men. These men find their identity in putting on a jersey of their favorite male athlete, but who don't have a clue of what it means to really be strong and courageous and caring and protective and providing. Many of today's babies without fathers are tomorrow's children without futures. Amen. That's true. But there's hope. Now, as we begin to delve into the scripture, let's agree today that the politically correct definition of a man does not work. In light of the research and what we see going on in today's families, obviously we are seeing the negative consequences of not following God's design for marriage and family. So where does being a healthy man begin? It begins here with mutual submission. Turn your Bibles to Ephesians, the fifth chapter, and the 21st verse. And Paul gives us a very amazing uh, look on what it means to have uh, a, a submission, be submitted to one another in, in relationships. The whole chapter is talking about relationships with, with a spouse and, and with children and with an employer, employee, okay? Verse 21 Ephesians, the fifth chapter, it says this. And read it with me, okay? You read it with me. It says what? Submit to one another out of what? Reverence for Christ. The Living Bible says honor Christ by submitting to each other. Now, the Greek word here, uh, hypotasso, it is the Greek word for submit. And it comes from two words in the Greek, meaning hypo, uh, under, and tasso, to place in order. So this word here in the Bible, Paul is using for submit, it means to place under in an orderly fashion, right? To arrange under. And so Paul is saying here that our God is a God of order. Why? Because he is the God who puts submission in the world. Amen? 
God is the creator of all things, and guess what? Everything, uh, whether they want to be submitted to him or not, but the Bible says one day every knee is going to bow. Every tongue is going to confess that what? Jesus is Lord. So here Paul gives us a glimpse of, of what, what it means to, to be submissive. And, and our, because our God is a God of order, we see in Genesis chapter 1 that God even brings order to a chaotic and a void and an empty world. So the concept of order starts with God. I remember when my wife and I were talking about what to call this series, I, I was, I was going to call it, Is Your House, Get Your House in Order. Is your wife in order? Is the man in order? Is your kids in order? Tara's like, no, nah, nah, that ain't going to work. That ain't going to work. She said, we, we, we need to work on the title. I said, oh, man, I just want everybody to be in order, order, order. But God is a God of order, right? Would you all agree? And, and so we see that, that God, even in the midst of chaos, he brings order. He, he brings function. Because what order does, it allows things to function correctly. There has to be an orderly way of doing things. In the military, there's a ranking system that creates order. In sports, players submit to coaches. On your job, you have a supervisor or a boss that you are submitted to. So guess what? Submission is a way of life. Somebody say submission is a way of life. And Paul tells us here in verse 21 and the remaining verses of this chapter that this is what is needed in order to have a healthy home and healthy relationships in the kingdom of God. Now, I'm not here to try to tell people how to live their life who are not kingdom people or Christ uh, living and fearing people. I'm talking today to the church. And if you're not a believer and you're watching and maybe you're here today and you're not a believer, God bless you. I hope I can help you. But what I'm dealing with is a subject matter for believers of Jesus Christ. And it's submission. There's mutual submission to one another. And there's submission to honor Christ. Now, there must be a willingness in Christian fellowship to serve one another, to learn from one another, and to be corrected by one another. Regardless of who we are, we are mutually submitted, and that's what Paul is letting us know. And so there's a, a mutual submission in serving one another as brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. That's why, you know, uh, I, I'm a church baby. I, I grew up in the church, and I grew up uh, uh, seeing all kind of things go on in the church. But, but one thing I, I often saw, and, and even being in full-time ministry now for, for 24, almost 24 years, I've seen that titles sometimes get the best of people. Bishop so-and-so, pastor so-and-so, missionary so-and-so. Well, guess what? The Bible says we are mutually submitted. I understand authority. I understand leadership. And, and guess what? I do get that, but not to the place where you are abusing and misusing people because of your authority. So we've got to be understanding, we've got to be careful that whenever we are in any kind of leadership position, that we are not using it for our own goals, <laughs> but that we are representing the kingdom of God. Amen? So in a healthy marriage, uh, it requires a clarity of roles. Everybody has a role. You know, there's people uh, uh, who like to watch a lot of movies. Jelana, she's uh, creative, and she writes uh, scripts and different things. When, when she's writing, she's writing different roles for different people. How many has ever been to a movie and everybody acted the same part? Huh? Anybody? So there, there, there's roles, right? There, there's roles that have to be played. And, and so, so, so submission requires certain roles, and it's really more about who's responsible in their role. Now, what I'm talking about, I'm about to share today is I'm, I'm going to talk to some men in the house today. Is that all right? 
Now, what I want to tell us men today is that this is going to be impossible to do without first being submitted to Jesus Christ. And until men are submitted to the lordship of Christ and step up to the plate and be the men that God has called them to be, guess what? Families and marriages will continue to collapse before our very eyes. Last week, I said the stats for Christians are not that much different than the stats of those who are non-Christians. Why? Because we're not applying God's word to what we do and how we live. So Ephesians, let's pick that back up in the 22nd verse in the 5th chapter. It says this, wives, submit yourselves, what? To your own husbands, as you do to the Lord. And I spent a lot of time last week on the importance of, of a man and a woman in a marriage covenant both being submitted to Christ. In verse 23, it says, for the husband is the head of the wife, a role as Christ is the head of the church, his role, his body of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, our role submitting to Christ, so also wives should what? Man, that was a week, that was a week, that was so weak. Wives should what? Oh, that was weak. I'm just going to stay here. Wives should what? You know, let's just go ahead and shut it all down now because y'all don't want to hear what God has to say. Wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, what? Oh, that was as weak as the women. Husbands, what? Oh, that's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. Love your wives. As just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with the word, uh, water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any blemish, but holy and blameless. I spent time on that last week, so please go and check it out on YouTube. But here, here's the application. Husbands are responsible in their role to love their wives the same way Jesus loved and gave himself up for his church. This love is not some kind of emotional I feel in love. <laughs> it's a love that does. Somebody say it's a love that does. This kind of love is a choice and not a feeling. Now, I'm talking to the men in the house and online today. Jesus didn't feel like dying on the cross. Matter of fact, Pastor Tyrone, he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he said, Father, if this cup could pass from me, please let it do. Jesus did not feel like dying on the cross for you or me. But guess what? Love does. Jesus chose to die for his bride. That's a demonstration of love that does the most and expects the least. I'm talking to the men today. Come on. As we love our wives, we should have that same kind of love that will do the most and expect the least. Well, pastor, when I do something for my wife, she don't do it back for me. So? Well, you know, she's just not, uh, well, what are you supposed to do, man? Man, come on, how to be a healthy man. I'm talking to the men today. And, and so here's the first step in being a healthy man. It's here. Number one, a healthy man's love for his wife is a love that does. <laughs> it's a love that does something. Now, I'm, I'm going to ask you a few questions that, that have to do with uh, caring and, and the responsibility or carrying the responsibility of the home, okay? So, so men, in, in other words, these are questions about if a man is actually leading and doing. Men, please listen. Please listen. These questions are not make, to make you feel bad, but to challenge you and to encourage you and to help bring you out of denial. <laughs> so number one, this is my first question to us men. You ready, men? You ready, men? Maybe I should just lower my voice for this message. Like my brother 
uh, back there who did so wonderful on the guitar, Brother Neil. He has a, like a nice deep voice. I like you, Brother Neil. Like, yeah, you know. <laughs> but listen, number one, who initiates spiritual growth in the home? I'm talking to the men. I'm asking you that question. Who initiates the spiritual growth in your home? Is, is it the wife or the husband that says, hey, let's, let's talk about the word today or let's pray about this or, hey, let's discuss what Pastor Terrell has been talking about these last few weeks. He preached really, really good today. <laughs> is it the man, are you as the man in your home leading the spiritual climate of your home? This is my next question for men today. Who feels the pressure of financial responsibility? Are the bills getting paid, right? Now, it's not a question of who makes the most money in the house. It's, it's not even a question on who has the better skill set of managing finances because it, I know in some homes that skill set is, is better suited for the wife. But what I'm talking about as men, do you know how your home is doing financially? Do you know how much debt your household is in? These are questions that every healthy man in a healthy home should be able to answer. I should not be how to come to you as a man and say, hey, you know, how is your finance? Well, I don't know. You know, my wife, she, she pays all the bills and she knows. Well, you should know because that is your responsibility as a man to know the financial condition of your home. Tell your wife, hey, let me see. Let me see what's being paid. Let me make sure things, if you have to get a second job or work overtime just to make sure. Listen, that pressure needs to be on you as a man, not on your wife. Oh, I should have got some amens from the women today. I know my wife is saying, amen, amen, amen. Number three, who disciplines the children when both of you are at home? <laughs> Is it you or your wife? That needs to be something that you think about. If both of you are at home and there's something that needs to take place in disciplining the children, the children need to see the male authority in the home. Somebody say it's tight, but it's right. Number four. This is my last question for us men today. Who initiates talking about problems, future plans, and, and areas of, of growth and development? You know, men, we should be asking those questions in our home of like, hey, where are we going as a, as a family? You know, what, what are we doing? What, what schools are the kids attending or should attend? What college is best uh, for our high school graduates? Those should be things that the men in the home, those questions should be asked. Why? Because we have to take responsibility for our families. We can't live as men with our head under the pillows. I know, I know this can be challenging, but let me tell you, I could not preach or teach this, this word if I was not living this kind of life as a man. My own father, who's a pastor, hey, he did not teach me. <clears throat> anything about finances. I, I remember when I was getting my master's uh, in seminary there, and uh, one of my last classes that I had was a class on premarital. And, and in that class, they gave us a budget. I had never budgeted in my life. Here I'm around 25, almost 26 probably at that time. And I'm like, wow, a budget. Man, this looks kind of cool. <laughs> Because, see, I had roommates that I had, and I had one roommate that he, he bounced so many checks, Michael Jordan came to our door. He bounced so many checks, the, the, the apartment complex said, y'all can't write no more checks. I said, oh, man, I was so mad. I said, bro, get a budget. So I had to learn. I had to grow. And my wife and I, when we first got married and we bought a home and all these credit card people are coming out, you know, we kind of had to learn the hard way. But what I'm saying is there is a way and to be responsible. Uh, one of the best uh, advice that I've ever received uh, before I got married was from a friend. He said, Terrell, when you get married, budget your income based upon only your income. And I said, what are you kidding? What? I'm, I'm marrying Tara. She need to get a job when I'm married. What are you talking about? No, he said, no, man. You need to budget on one income. I said, man, 
okay, I'm going to try it out. And, and we did. We did. And, and there are seasons that we didn't because Tara has worked and she's working now. But, hey, if Tara wanted to take a vacation, we'd be okay. But don't. Amen. <laughs> the financial responsibility is on the man. And that's why we as men, we do things that love does, right? Love does for our wives, but we also have to have to know that love is also caring for our wives. Paul says in that same chapter, the 28th verse, let's look at that. So we, we got that men, right? Love does something. Baby, I love you. And let me tell you, women, if you're, if you're dating someone or you want to get married one day and you're talking to someone, if that man don't have a job, I say run. Oh, well, he, he going to get a job. He's been looking for six months. Really? I see hi, I'm hiring signs all up and down the street. So Paul says not only does love do, does something, but love also cares for our wife. In verse 28, in the same way, what does it say? Husbands ought to love their wives as their what? Own Bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. That word there for love is agapao. It means uh, the God kind of love, right? To favor and to honor and to respect and to esteem. It means to prize. So, men, we should be appreciating and encouraging our wives. If you are a man and you, uh, you know, and you're intimidated by your wife and her gifts and her skills and her abilities, I say you need to grow. You need to encourage your wife with all of the, the blessing that she is. I remember when we were planning this church, um, we were in this, we had to go through some very intense training to be church planters. And, and me and my wife were sitting at the table and we were talking to other church planters. And I'm like, hey, man, what, what you doing, man? My wife is working. I'm going to plant this church. I said, bro, you better get a job. No, my wife, she working. I'm like, daring, Tara, th these girls, they, they sugar mamas. I'm like, Tara, do you want to be a sugar mama? She said, no. Nope. She said, you're going to keep working when you plant that church and you're going to work. I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no sugar mamas allowed at Live Free. Amen. But men, we have to encourage our wives, cherish our wives, treasure them, honor and respect them as we enjoy them, as we are devoted to them. That's the kind of love that Paul is talking about. Now, this kind of love is a caring love. This love cares. It's a love that feeds. It's a love that nourishes. And so when Paul says that no man, he, you know, he, 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 he takes care of his own body, he nourishes or feeds his body, Paul is using a word there that means to provide food for, to nourish up to maturity, to promote the health and the well-being of an individual. So here's our second step in being a healthy man. A healthy man's love for his wife is what? A love that cares. Number two, it's a love that cares. Amen? So men, as we are loving our wife, it's not only a love that does, but it's a love that that cares as men who operate in the order of God within a covenant, a marriage relationship. We are responsible for caring and nourishing our wives spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and relationally. That's our job. God created the man as the primary instrument to meet the needs of a woman and the woman the needs of a man. <laughs> How many know that a man completes a woman? Come on. And how many know that a woman can complete a man? Come on. Amen. We all know what, what, what happened in the Garden of Eden when Adam was lonely and God said, I'm going to make a help meet. That word there actually in the Hebrew can also mean equal. Come on. Because God has called us to oneness. And oneness, let me tell you this, oneness cannot happen in a homosexual or lesbian relationship. It is biologically impossible. 
Woo, pastor, are you going there again? Yes, I am, because you didn't call me. God did. And so when you look at the biology, I teach this at the church. Amen. When you come into this earth, there's only two kind of plumbing you can have. I don't care what you want to call yourself. You've got a certain plumbing that identifies who you are. I'm going to keep it G-rated for the kids today. Amen. And so when God created a woman, he created a woman to complete the man. I was reading the other day, man, God is so amazing. When, when we plant our seed, amen, we're planting it into a womb and an, and an egg, and that's when life be, becomes. You, you can't get life with a man and a man. Can y'all give me an amen today? Are y'all scared of the culture? I'm not. You can't get life with a woman and a woman. Can I get an amen? So God created us to complement one another. I said to my 11, I said, man, out of the 2.5 billion that was swimming, you, you're the result, you know. Give God some praise, amen. <laughs> hey, God started all this. I didn't. I'm just, I'm just teaching it, amen. So when a man loves his wife and he cares for her and, and that man sees his primary, primary role is to what? To give. Man, we've cr been created to give. The woman's been created to receive. Even again in the biological sense, we've been created to give. Women to receive. And so men, I want you to be encouraged today. Listen, you might feel like, you know, pastor, you're kind of killing me right now. <laughs> Pastor, you stepping on my toes. Pastor, I, I, I'm about to turn off the, 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 the online whatever thing device you're using. No, hang in there with me, brothers. Hang in there with me. Because it's important that you understand God's design for a man in the home. And as a man, as we lead our homes and, and we are become strong in the Lord and, and we become men of courage and, and we become men who are making a difference in our wives' lives, in our children's lives. Listen, we are men who are coming to a place of taking responsibility of being the head of our homes. And I tell people, anything with two heads is a monster. There needs to be one head in the home. Can, brothers, y'all need to be loud. Oh, amen, amen, pastor, amen. One head in the home. Because when God looks at a home, he's looking at the one who is responsible as the head. If your home is out of order and your home is crazy and it looks like the culture, then it's your fault as the man. Now, I know we're dealing with times where, where there's a lot of single ladies and they're raising kids. And listen, there's still hope for you. You trust in God. Amen. You love God. You wait on the man that God is going to bring you. You raise your son and daughter the best way you know and stay close to the church. Amen. Where your son, amen, can be around godly men or your daughter can be around godly women. Come on. Amen. There's hope. There's grace. But there also is a way that God designed this to work. And last time I checked, none of us in here or online, we're smarter than God. God's design works. Well, you know, uh, I'm just progressive. And, you know, those things are for the old-time people. Terrell, you're just old-fashioned. Guess what? You label me whatever you want to label me, but I'm going to live for God, and I'm going to do it like God says, and I'm going to experience his blessings. I'm going to experience his peace. I'm going to experience his joy. Hallelujah. Because that's what God has designed. 1 Timothy 5 and 8, it says this, anyone who does not what, I'm talking to the men today, what provide for their relatives and especially for their what? Own household has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. We're talking about how a man should provide for his home. This is the, the words of Paul to Timothy. 
Now, if you don't want to go by this, guess what? That you, you can live your life however you want to live it. But I'm, I'm a preacher and a pastor, and, and I just actually believe that God's word is still relevant in 2020. Maybe I'm a little naive. Well, I'm still going to do it. Why? Because I know it works for me. Been married 23 years. My wife's still, still in love with me when I wake up in the morning. She's like, baby. Because I'm doing it God's way. Hallelujah. But it says, listen, men. The responsibility for providing for our families, guess what? It's on us. The phrase, anyone who does not provide, in that verse we just read, it, it, it's, is a first-class conditional statement in the Greek. And it can be better translated this way. When any of you does not provide. The word there, provide, means to plan before, right? So, so this word indicates that forethought is necessary to provide care for one's family. I think I referenced this a few weeks ago, but there's a, a, a lady, an African-American lady who has a, an amazing organization, a nonprofit that helps uh, inner city kids and things. And, and they, their, their ministry put up a billboard uh, in, in an inner city and where there's a lot of, of crime and poverty and single parent homes. And she put on the billboard, listen, if you want to get out of poverty, finish high school, get married. Have kids with someone that you're married to and get a job, right? Some, for, some basic things. And, and guess what? Black Lives Matter movement came after her. They, they sued and, and they went to the billboard company and they got the billboards taken down and it became a big fight. Well, guess what? Black Lives Matter. I'm sorry, but God's word says to be married. <laughs> God's word says, hey, ladies, listen, if, if you're having these kids without a male in the home, it's going to be much harder for you, much more difficult for you to then get out of poverty. Amen? And so God's word works. Ladies, listen, you're single. Man, stay, stay single, stay focused, and, and, and do what God is leading you to do. And then when you're right at the right time, God will bring your Adam. Amen. Because we are the ones who are responsible for providing in our family. The third step to being a healthy man is this. A healthy man, what? Provides for his family. That's what healthy men do. Well, pastor, I just, well, you know, hey, I've, I've had to do some things. I'm not the one to talk to. <laughs> I, I'm not the one to come at with excuses. You know why? Because I've had to get two and three jobs at times in my life. My, my friend who, who's here today, he's a chaplain as well, and I told him for five years I was working midnights to 7 a.m. You thought that was easy. No, it's not easy. But I had to do what I had to do in order to get my, my family to a place where, where it just wasn't so tight. You know, we had some business debt and, and some things we had accumulated because my wife has a business and, and we've had businesses in the past. And, and guess what? I went to work to pay down that debt. Hallelujah. And now I have more flexibility. I can resign and be okay. Because they wanted us as chaplains to start going into the COVID rooms. And I said, no, I just opened up my church. I'm not going to do that. So I'm going to leave all this money on the table every month. But guess what? God's got me. I'm a tithe payer. Amen. Amen. I give offerings and alms. Amen. And I got a sugar mama. Amen. Come on. Yeah, y'all didn't see that coming. I got sugar mama Tara. Hallelujah. Praise God. <laughs> so, men, we are responsible for providing. And, and failing to provide a, or plan for the needs of our families, it makes us guilty of two things. Number one, Paul says we've denied the faith. This does not refer to the loss of your salvation. But Paul here, he's not judging your ultimate destination in heaven or hell. But he's saying, guess what? Because of your current actions, you basically are not walking the walk as you are talking the talk. 
Paul is basically saying that if you are a believer and you're not taking care of your family, you are worse than an unbeliever. <laughs> Why? Because you need to be compassionate and, and caring and loving your wife and your children and providing for them. Now, you all understand, I know there's circumstances and sometimes men become disabled and, and things happen. I get that. But what I'm talking about is what the norm is. Amen. You all understand that, right? And then second, what happens when we're not providing for our families as men? Paul says again, we become worse than an unbeliever. And even in Paul's time, pagans or unbelievers knew the importance of providing for their families. I'm here to encourage you, church family. Listen, we are not to have the mindset of depending on the government. Why don't I want to depend on the government? Because they waste money. I'd rather be in control of my own finances because every time I pay taxes, something's not going right with the government. The government, G-O-V-M-N-T, government. Why? Because people run the government. And guess what? Not everybody in the government of people of integrity and people who are doing the right things with all this trillions of dollars coming in. I do not want to depend on the government, little g. I want to depend on God, the big G. I want God to bless the work of my hands. I want to start a business. I want to do whatever is in my skill set to do. Amen. So that I can provide for what God has given me to provide for. And I'm almost through. So when, a, when you're providing as a healthy man, you have a foresight and an insight on, on what is necessary to take care of your family. A man who neglects his natural duty to provide for his family or who lacks the foresight and the insight to take care of them, guess what? He's living contrary to the faith. Don't say you're a member of Live Free Church if, you, you, if your bills is get, they ain't get paid and it's all late and your wife is stressed out. Tell them you're a member of First Baptist Snellville. <laughs> just teasing, just teasing, just teasing. First Baptist Snellville got a lot, a lot of nice buildings, amen. They're doing some, some work over there, amen. But just, just teasing on that, just teasing. But what I am saying is, listen, men, we got to get our houses in order, Amen. We've got to be the men of God who are leading and, and who, are, who are leading spiritually and, and leading our wives and our children. And we're, we're the ones who are disciplining. We're, we're the ones who are speaking into our, our wives' lives and our children's lives. We're creating an atmosphere. I, I, was, I had a meeting not uh, long ago with some other pastors, and, and uh, we're, we're, we're doing this ministry um, network together. And, and this pastor came from a very, very large ministry here. If I named it, most of you would know know it and and he worked there for 15 years you know woke up one day burnt out confused and just said I quit <laughs> a lot of pressure sometimes in mega church ministry and I told him I said hey you know what pastor so and so I said you know what success in ministry looks like I said it looks like us loving our wives loving our children our children not hating God or us <laughs> Because we are pastors. That's what success are. That's what success is. And I can stand here today and say, thank God for covenant marriage with Tara. Thank God that my boys are here every week serving in ministry and they have their own relationship with God. Because I didn't neglect my wife and my family to, a.k.a. do ministry or also know I was doing ministry. I didn't neglect them for that. No, I have boundaries. I have balances. I have a day off where I don't want nobody calling me. Well, Pastor, aren't you supposed to be available 24-7? No, that's 911. Yeah, that's, that's, that's 911. Well, well, Pastor, I, I, no, no. We got other pastors, too, and they, you know, they have responsibilities that really help me out. But, but really, husbands, what, if you're a business owner today, what does success in business look like? Well, loving your wife, loving your kids, making sure your home is together. What is success in corporate or what is success in, in your role uh, on your job? Well, it's making sure you have a balanced life because those kids will not be kids forever. 
And I'm going to close with this. I remember when we had our oldest son. He's now, uh, I believe he's, what, 22 years old, right? I got that right? Yeah. I'm getting old. So he's getting old. I'm getting old. 22. But I saw little Trevor in, in the center. He was just, you know, Trevor was one of the babies we could just place on the floor. And he wouldn't move. He was like the perfect child. And then Travis came up. We put him up. Ah! Travis is like a little, little rabbit man running around the child. We're like, what? Same parents. What, what, what's Trevor said in the middle? Travis, sit down somewhere. Amen. But I remember when Trevor was sitting there and the Lord said this. He said to me, and, and this scripture came alive as revelation. He said, your son is going to do what he sees his father doing. I said, whoa. You guys remember that scripture? Jesus said, I do what I see my father. And so the words of Jesus rang strong in me. I said, man, Trevor is going to grow up looking at my life, and he's going to eventually do what I do. Oh, my gosh, Lord, that's a lot of responsibility. I just pray he's a better man than me because I've got these areas. And God said, yeah, work, work on them, work on them, because you're his example. And I thank God, amen, that we as men, guess what? Wherever you are today, start there. It's not too late, amen? Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, for our roles as men and women and, and, and children as, as families. Lord, and I pray for all the men listening today that, that they as, as husbands would assume the leadership role in their homes. I pray. God, that their leadership is not uh, dictatorial or condescending or, or patronizing, but, Lord, that they would lead as men who follow Christ, as men who love Christ, as men who, who are examples to those around them. Christ, you love the church. You loved us with compassion and mercy and forgiveness, respect and selflessness. In the same way, I pray that we men, as healthy men, who are submitted to the Lordship of Christ, I pray that we love our wives, love our children, and provide for our families. I thank you, Lord, for your compassion and your mercy and your forgiveness. I thank you, Lord, that you are our authority in our life, and as men, we dedicate today resubmitting our lives to the lordship of, of, of who you are, your, your lordship. Hallelujah. And I just want the men to repeat after me. And, you know, if, if you don't want to repeat after me, that, that's fine. But I just, I do want to lead our men just in a prayer of, of confession. And, and, and I just want us to pray and, and, and get on the page of being a healthy man, a whole man, a man who loves God and his wife and his children. So I just want you to repeat after this, after me, man. It's just say, Father God, I thank you. I don't hear any men repeating after me. Father God, that's much better. I thank you for calling me to be a man. I take my responsibility seriously to lead my family, to lead my wife, to lead my children. I thank you for your grace, for your spirit, for your anointing that is upon me and within me to lead my family. I will not give up and I will not give in to what the enemy plans are for my life. I thank you that I am a healthy man. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Praise God. And you might be here today, and we're about to close, but if you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, I want to give you an opportunity to come to, to know the Lord and you might be here or you might be watching online and you've never committed your life to Christ, 
we, we do our best almost every Sunday to give you an opportunity because it's all about us giving our lives to Christ. Amen. And so if that's you, you're watching online, if you're here today, I'm just going to lead you in a prayer. And again, it's not the, the, the prayer that is really the, the, the essential part. It's, it's your heart. It's the change in your heart. It's, it's, it's really what you're about and what you want God to do for you. Amen. And But I'm just going to say this prayer. And you can repeat after me if, if you don't know Christ and you want to know him today. Uh, I thank you, Lord, for the sacrifice of your son, Jesus. I believe that you sent your only begotten son, your only unique son, to this earth to be born in a manger. He lived among us. He showed us and taught us how to live. Then he died on a cross for my sin. I repent of my sin today. Please forgive me. I am sorry. I need Jesus as my Savior. Because of his shed blood, I am now cleansed. I am forgiven. I am made whole. In Jesus' name. And I also give you my life, Lord. And I ask you to be the Lord of my life. Amen and amen. Let's give God a hand praise. Praise God. Amen. Well, thank you for being here. You know, um, before the pandemic, of course, we would have altar call and we would call people up and pray and, and place our hands and, and all of that. But we're, we're not doing that right now. We want to respect the virus. <laughs> we want to respect people and all that. So um, just know that we are praying for you and we know that there are needs. And Tara and I, we pray for you and your families. And, uh, and, and please know that we love you. And uh, next week, Tara will be... Tara will be speaking, and I, I pray that she she really just, you know, just lays her hair down and just, just teaches and preaches under the anointing of God. Let's just, she does all the time, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. But let's all stand as we close in a word of prayer, and, and um, again, it's been a wonderful Sunday. Thank you for, for being here. Uh, a Live Free Church, we exist for five reasons, right? We are empowering people to live a life of freedom through Jesus Christ, but we exist to worship God with passionate expression to share the good news of Jesus with others, to connect with other believers in meaningful relationships, to empower what? Leaders to fulfill their God-given destiny and to prepare disciples to impact present-day culture. I pray that you would have a blessed week, and I pray that God's favor and blessings and his face would shine upon you as you go be kingdom people in a culture that needs to see the love of Jesus. Amen. God bless. See you next week. We hope you enjoyed today's message and pray that you experience the freedom God has for you through his son, Jesus Christ. John chapter 8 verse 36 says, if the son gives you freedom, you are free. If you would like more information about Live Free Church, please visit us on the web at www.livefreechurch.org.